Oh. All right. Good morning. Good evening, everybody, wherever you are in the world. Uh, today we're here with Dr. Shari, who has been a part, who's been participating in the Rising Witch program and teaching all about burning times and the sacred feminine and the reclamation of the sacred feminine through words and mythology. And so we have her with us today. And Dr. Sherry, thank you so much for being here. I have read a little bit about your work and I have listened to the interview last time. And so I would love to hear, can you tell us more about your dissertation that, and your exploration of, tell, yes, I would love to hear more about your view and perspective okay. and where you're located. So the dissertation um, on the sacred, how the sacred feminine has been demonized through, well, all sorts of things, language, history, government, law, and uh, remissing goddess myth. So I got interested in this. Um, oh gosh, it's like it's like thirty years ago. When I started doing this, um, I was at a retreat that included um, act, active imagination, and and so we guided guided imagery. So we were being guided, and I had a horrible horrible cold. I could not focus on what the leader was talking about, but I managed to go on my own imagery or my own journey there, and and started thinking about how is it that one root in, in any language really can be attached to other you know, prefixes and suffixes to, to be either, to create either a very positive word or a very negative word. And the first, the first root that I worked with was the MAG, which simply means knowledge, but when it becomes attached to the Magi, these are, were wise men, uh, Zoroastrians, uh, magic, which can be either positive or negative, depending on who's talking about it, imagination, which is a, which is a good thing. But I got, that's where I went. And so I started exploring that and discovered all of these words in the English language that are, have very negative meaning. In fact, they are used to put down women. But as I explored those specific words, I started to find out when you go back far enough, they originally were all holy sacred references to the goddess and, and the whole idea and mother earth and, and goddess religion and everything. And um, how, how, how did we go <laughs> from that to where we are now? So you can learn a lot about what happens in a culture through its own language, um, the words themselves before you even start getting into like its literature, its law, its history. Um, and that's how I got started even before I went to Pacifica Graduate Institute to write my dissertation on this very thing. So I've discovered it's over 200 words, but the dissertation only had room for 12. So I had to, you know, which are the ones that are really, <clears throat> really would hit home. So I did come up with 12. Oh. And oops. sorry, it's so dry here. We're down to like 6% humidity. Wow. <clears throat> are sorry. you in New Mexico? <laughs> yeah, I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Okay. And we're having problems with fires. <clears throat> it's way north of me, but the south, the, the smoke comes south. So please, I, I beg everyone's forgiveness. Sure. And also, I, I'm sorry, I didn't introduce you properly initially, Dr. Sherry. So uh, from what I understand, you are a professor, you've been educator or school teacher, and I think also teaching older people at the Osher Institute. And I think this is all so empowering um, to have a teacher like you. I remember when I had professors who uh, had 
you know, were rich with story, rich with mythology. It really inspired me. And so I think I, we're so lucky to have you. I feel a little nervous also to be talking to you. So I'll just say <laughs> that. Um, Please don't, don't be. Yeah. So, so, um, so I was going to share what some of those words are um, and what some of them there wasn't room to put in. So, of course, bitch is and, and witch and whore. Um, and then we go into, believe it or not, chaos and abyss, which which actually refer to the cosmic womb and and the the potential for being in the cosmic womb before it's manifested into this world. So let's see, that's three, that's five. Oh, um, serpent, cow, dog, all, all demonized animals, particularly dog and cow because of their association with the fertility of the goddess. Um, let's see what other, uh, I, th I think I included cauldron because, because again, any pot is a womb image. And particularly in Celtic mythology, we have all of these, we have the three major cauldrons, um, the uh, one of poetry and inspiration, one that grants anyone whatever they want or need, which is primarily food and drink. And a third one that had the, the understanding of, if you put a dead person in this cauldron, that person would be reborn. Although they couldn't speak because they weren't allowed to talk about what they saw while they were dead. Then in Celtic mythology also, um, the underworld is seen as being like a huge cauldron and having cauldrons that, that kings and various men in, and various Celtic myths want to bring back to this world for that usually because of an impossible task that they have to complete to get the woman they love. Huh. So yeah, yeah. Celtic mythology is is really is really interesting. And of course that's my tradition. That's the tradition I come out of. <clears throat> but basically for the last 7,000 years, um from the time of the rise of patriarchal cultures and as they moved out of their places of origin, moved into other places, they, they began to, to conquer. And when they conquer, when you conquer, what you wanna do is you wanna create a situation in which your power won't be threatened. So since women and the goddess were in power in these places, um, they, they changed the stories, they changed the myths to change women and the sacred feminine from a good thing to an evil thing. Um, they changed the law. The Code of Hammurabi is a really good case where, where you see the change in laws between women being able to have their own property and that their body was their own property to where that was changed, to where all that became the property of a man. Father, brother, uncle, husband did not matter. And, and when that happened, then you had new words come into, into the, the language that did not exist in matriarchal cultures. A really good one, well, two really good ones are bastard and adultery. Adultery mm -hmm. is, is about property and stealing that property. And, and uh, when that property is stolen, then it has been damaged. And so when you have a patriarchy, which is about scarcity, and it's about men running everything, and they run everything by amassing power, wealth, control, um, one of the ways that they increase that <clears throat> is buying and selling property whether that be animals or women or children. And so if a woman took it upon herself to love whom she chose and to have sex with that person, um, she had stolen her body from whatever man controlled it. And, and 
she became damaged. He could not increase his wealth by marrying her off to whom he chose. So, um, and that became a way in, in um, over time for men or for women who had fallen in love with somebody that the way she would get to marry that man would be he would kidnap her and <clears throat> if they could keep from being caught for two days it would be assumed well no man and woman could be alone for two days without having <laughs> sex so, so clearly you've damaged my property so here you take her and and so women and and the men they loved would use that as a, a loophole to be able to be together and not be forced into marriage and then of course in europe with the rise of christianity there were a lot of women who chose to go into the church to become a nun or whatever to avoid being forced to marry so you have this whole history of the last seven thousand years um and it's not just in the west it's in it's in the east as well you know china has historically had a very patriarchal culture um japan also the, the whole very patriarchal culture so it it's pretty global yeah um you know the, this mm. idea of patriarchy yeah and so actually in bali they, there's this tradition as well of in in some parts in some areas they have the tradition of kidnapping the girl they stay together for a bit you know ritually kidnapping so that wow so it people's minds are like similar all over the the world and I yeah it's just striking to think that I mean the way I've grown up for me marriage has I'm not married yet but basically marriage has always been the norm and it's assumed of course you have to have children with the thought you know the family unit is mother father and children and it's tell us more about that because it's kind of you know it's such an i think it's a new idea for many people that whoa you could have a child and and the child could grow up really well and really healthy and it doesn't and empower and the mother <laughs> be empowered and you don't have to know who the the father was so yeah i just want to hear more about that that we know i think for us like family, the family unit is norm, but tell us more about what it would have been like before or uh, not even before, but now. Ah. Okay, so uh -huh. in matriarchal cultures, um, there's the idea that you don't know who your father is. You know your mother and you know your mother's family. So you know your uncles, but the father was temporary and, and and how long he stayed around <clears throat> depended on the mother. Um, so he might come home one day, depending on the culture, like um, uh, uh, some Eastern cultures, I wanna say, uh, it's so far back, we're, we're talking about uh, before countries. There's an area of Indonesia in Western Sumatra, in Minangkabau, but they're matriarchal over there, so the, mother and uncle that's more of the unit so right and I've, so the father might come home and if it was like a yurt in mongolia the whole house would have been turned so he couldn't find the entrance into the house all of his stuff would be outside so so children were raised by the mother's family they they you know there there was the the male influence with her brothers or her uncles or you know their their grandfather on their mother's side um in in the greek epic the odyssey there's a moment when athena uh, so odysseus is you know away fighting a war for nine years and then he takes another nine years trying to get back home while he's gone his son telemachus and the goddess athena um she talks to him and she says you know to, to keep him safe she says says you need to go search for your father and and build your own renown while you're there and his response is 
no one is ever sure who their father is. So you can see that tradition <clears throat> was still alive, although it was in transition, but it was still alive, that that was written about in this epic, which is something most people aren't aware of, is that the power of the feminine and a matriarchal society still existed and was in that epic. Um, but how it was being marginalized already already back in whatever time that was. So, so the whole idea of what we think of as, as the family unit um, comes up with patriarchy. Um, and among the Hebrew who become Jewish people, there is this tradition of um, if the father, if the husband dies, to keep all the property in the family, one of the brothers marries the widow. And, and yeah, and, and this would have been also in a time, that, that's not so much, that's really not practiced anymore. But <clears throat> when it was practiced, um, that was also in a time of, of polygamy, when a man could have, did have more than one wife. So, that was practiced in order to keep um, all inheritance within that family that the husband came from. <clears throat> so this is why you have the story in the Old Testament <clears throat> of Naomi and Ruth, where Ruth, yeah, Naomi and Ruth, Ruth's husband has died and, they, and her mother-in-law says, you know, you need to go back to your people. I'm going to go back to my people. And Ruth says, whither thou goest, I will follow, which is to Naomi, not to a husband. <laughs> so she's so she goes with Naomi back to her husband's people. And and then the story proceeds of how she basically gets a new husband, which is within that same family. His name is Boaz. And there's this whole whole storyline of how she attracts his attention <clears throat> and Naomi helps arrange it so that in the end, Boaz and Ruth marry and, and it's implied that it is a love match that he does fall in love with her. So, so, so there, so with the, the family unit, it comes ab about, it's about inheritance going from the husband to the sons, not to daughters. Now, in a matriarchal culture, inheritance was from mother to daughter. And a really good story about that is, again, in the Old Testament, is the story of, I think it's Jacob, and he falls in love with Rachel, who has a sister, Leah. But he has to go to their father and, and be a servant to the father for seven years in order to get permission to marry Rachel. Well, the father fools them and puts Leah in there, hidden with a veil and everything. So Jacob labors for another seven years to get Rachel. So he has two wives and Rachel is packing up all of, all of, uh, the family's stuff, their, their mother's things. And there are some sacred objects which give a person in the family the authority to do a variety of things. Their, their uncle, or their, yeah, that's their father, wants to go into the tent and get those objects. And what Rachel does is she puts them all under a saddle and sits on top of the saddle, knowing he will not go anywhere near that saddle because she's sitting on it. And so now it's unclean. And so she uses that incoming Jewish patriarchy tradition of, of women's menstruation and birth and all of that and being unclean or clean. And that's how she protects these sacred objects because they belong to her. As the as the youngest daughter, so a lot of t in some cultures, matriarchal cultures, this inheritance went 
from mother to youngest daughter. So we see that all being changed over time as these patriarchal cultures come in. So, and that's why the father wanted these objects because patriarchy is, is emerging um, among Hebrew tribes, which were originally very matriarchal. Wow. So let's see, there's so much information there. So I would love to, okay, so this is amazing. You just have so, you're filled with so many stories and so much understanding. So uh, to summarize a little bit, so first we heard about the story of Naomi and Ruth. And from there, from what I briefly picked up is that, so the point of this story is that she, Ruth or Na she, she chose her husband in the end and it was a, it was a love marriage. And is that, is that correct that it was a, that, yes, but it yeah. was within her husband's family. Okay. She chose to follow this Hebrew tradition wow. of everything staying in the husband's family. Okay. But, but the implication is, is that the man uh, did fall in love with her and it was a love match, but still okay. it's within the husband's family. Okay, so keeping, all right, all right. That makes sense now that the, the, the idea of the I-ness and in minus it seems like in patriarchy that's what i think like in the vedic tradition we would call all of the difficulties that we have um in in some total that's called ignorance and in ignorance we have i-ness and minus and i own this thing and you're mine and um that's yours and this belongs to me and so it seems like patriarchy is kind of synonymous with more and more of that of property. Mm, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Definitely. And then also after that, then you were telling us the story of if you can say that I, I'd like to hear just the, like what are what are the key takeaways from the second story? Okay, so the key yeah. takeaways with Jacob, Rachel, and Leah, and there's several, and some I didn't even go into. Wow. Um, the, ta the takeaway is that we can see in Old Testament stories, and this one is the only one. We can also see it in Sarah and Abraham. We can also see it in Jezebel. That's yes, a whole we want to hear episode. about, yes. <laughs> want to hear about this one next. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, the takeaway with Jacob, Rachel, and Leah is that you still can see that patriarchal, it, it's, um, it, it's in transition from patriarchy to, pa from matriarchy to patriarchy. And therefore, there is still some power that women have, and, and that it, it is seen as coming through down through the sacred feminine, uh, but but that in Rachel and Leah's father's action in trying to get the sacred objects that go from mother to daughter, that symbolizes he is part of the patriarchy and they're trying to take all that power away from a matriarchal culture and and concentrate it within the patriarchy. Rachel outsmarts him though. So, so, you, so it's showing a transition which takes years. It, it, it goes over a long period of time. And we can see it in myths in different cultures around the world where it happens. So you wanted to hear about Jezebel. This, this is wonderful. Queen Jezebel, um, her mother and father were the high priestess and high priest of, of goddess worship in Sidon. And she marries, Jezebel marries King Ahab, who's Hebrew. Um, so he builds, as a wedding gift, he builds for her a temple to Astarte, for whom she is a high priestess. And so when she moves into his household, she brings with her something like 400 priests and 400 priestesses for this worship of Astarte. Well, the, the prophet of the time, um, Ezekiel, 
I mean, he flips out and it's war to him because he's because politics or government and religion are inextricably intertwined. Um, their their government is based on their religion. And so he sees Israel in danger of spiritual adultery and going to, you know, going to, well, shale, hell. Um, so he, it's all out war for him. And he tells, he tells, he's, he's livid because Jezebel as a priestess <coughs> would have had the right to advise the king, <clears throat> which she does. And she advises King Ahab at one point not to kill a soldier who had been captured. She, she advises the king to spare this man. And Ahab does. This flips Ezekiel out even more because basically where, where the Hebrews are living in this point, they are surrounded by lots of other cultures because when they moved into this promised land, they had to conquer a bunch of other cultures to, to, to get it based on their belief that their God promised it to them. Um, so, so Ezekiel represents this idea of we have to have a constant show of strength, that we are stronger than these others, no, no mercy. And Jezebel advised King Ahab to show mercy. Mm -hmm. So Ezekiel basically tells Ahab that he will be die, he will he will be killed and his blood will be licked up by the dogs. Dogs being a curse. Okay, he's cursing Ahab. Um, because dogs, among the other things that they do, besides just being sacred to the goddess, they they also um eat carrion okay which is a good thing but you know this is where ezekiel is coming from and in in the end ahab is killed his blood is licked up by dogs he ezekiel also well he accuses of jezebel of prostitution another word that exists only because of patriarchy and nowhere is she guilty of prostitution but but there, but you know, this is what he's saying. You've brought in a different religion. Uh, my people are turning to your religion, and therefore you're prostituting. And and these these people are committing adultery. And so, in the end, she is thrown out of a window to the courtyard, and dogs eat her body. Oh. yeah. The takeaway here is that here was this powerful woman, a priestess of the goddess, and by throwing her out of the window and the dogs eating her body, it is a consuming uh, or destroying of everything of the sacred feminine and absorbing it into the patriarchy and making it at the same time as absorbing it, absorbing it in a way to where the feminine is in not only inferior but inherently evil. Uh -oh. Which is not true. So, <laughs> but that's that's the short version of, of of the story of Jezebel. They they there's a part where they have this whole spiritual contest, and um, but but in the end, that that Ezekiel's plan is to destroy Jezebel. And to destroy Ahab as as someone who betrayed his people, and and his religion. <laughs> wow! So she was so she was accused of being a prostitute for people being attracted to to her teachings, to her to her. I'm assuming her way of being, her mercy, and then she's turned right. into a prostitute from that. Right, right. She's accused of that because of her her religious, her spiritual practice. And so there's and the, because the, people, yeah, people are turning away. And in the Old Testament, in all of the books that are, um, they have the names of various prophets, you see this kind of being replayed out over and over and over again. The prophets are having a fit. 
because the people are going back to goddess worship, which they did when there would be <clears throat> famine or other culture, society, community-wide disasters because this new God was not doing what, what the goddess had done to protect them. And so they, they would go back to that worship and these, these prophets of Yahweh would I'd flip out and talk about spiritual adultery and, oh. and yeah, mm -hmm. and that going to priestesses to perform a certain ritual called the Haros Gamos was to go into prostitution and that the, the women who performed the, that ritual were prostitutes, you know, which the prostitution carries the implication of it's a paid business transaction. This was a spiritual ritual of involving sacred sex, but, but these patriarchal prophets did not see it that way at all. So they, you know, and they, you know, so you see this happening all through the Old Testament as a way of demonizing the sacred feminine and, and women in general. Wow. So then that, that, you know, goes with the idea. I think there's this continuum of uh, sexuality, spirituality, enjoying the beautiful, enjoying the mystical, and how like those are judged as bad. You know, you're dark for going that way. You're, you know, you're too much if you go that way. Uh, that's a dangerous thing to be going that way. So um, I think since you've been really involved in the Rising Witch program, can you talk more about that continuum then of attraction to nature, attraction to spirituality, sexuality, and how it gets in, in our society, how it's put down through patriarchal culture that's really within okay. all of us. Right, okay, so in the continuum, um, so we see how it's done in the Old Testament. We got a brief look of Greek, Greek culture uh, in more European culture with the rise of Christianity. And it is, it's with the rise of Christianity. So you have, you have the, even, even though there's been this transition from matriarchy to patriarchy, you still have that worship of nature and the sacred feminine. Um, as I mentioned in, in my talk under Rising Witch, that there were a lot of temples in Europe of certain goddesses, Isis being one of them. She was an extremely popular uh, goddess from, uh, from Egypt and had temples in, in, what, in Par what we now call Paris. So, so the people had continued to hold on to this worship and, and there weren't priestesses so much anymore, but there were these, they had evolved into wise women who the, the knowledge had been passed down from mother to daughter. This information about knowing about uh, plants and, and all of their properties and how they could hurt or harm and how the amount of what you gave, uh, you know, of, of an herb, uh, if you gave too much could harm, but if you gave the right amount, it cured. And so, and so these women were gone to all the time because there, there was no medical profession, but a medical profession did arise. Unfortunately, these doctors were trained <clears throat> by the church. So, so you don't really have medicine. You have things like leaching and bloodletting, which generally did more harm than good. <clears throat> they did not know how to stop plagues as as historically we know how many at least three plagues through Europe coming from you know carried by rats that were on ships that came into ports in in Europe <clears throat> um, so they didn't know how to control or cure that at all they thought so you have these doctors wearing these masks with these 
big bills that held something in it that they could breathe because they thought that might prevent it. They had no idea what they were dealing with. The women, that <clears throat> these wise women were more effective in helping women in childbirth. <clears throat> they knew about birth control. They were the ones who did not, you know, they weren't afraid of dealing with death or dead bodies. They prepared the dead bodies for burial. And um, both the priests of the church and these medical medical men who were trained by the church were very, they were jealous. They thought that their territory was being encroached upon and, and that this must stop. So of course, one of the things they did is said, you cannot practice healing arts of any kind unless you're trained. And since women were barred from attending any of these medical schools, uh, <clears throat> they legally were not permitted to, to practice this, but they continued to do so because the people continued to go to them. And so, but, you know, it was okay until uh, the the 13th century when when the Pope in 1232 um, decided that what they were doing was heresy. Interesting thing about heresy as a term, it only means to think differently. So yeah, you know, they were thinking differently than the church, whose whose mandate, self mandate was to spread Christianity around the world to, to replace all re other religions with Christianity and only Christianity. And Christianity was the only path. If you weren't Christian, you were going to go to the Christian hell. And that just goes on and on and on. So they had a lot of influence then on the laws being passed. <clears throat> so a papal bull declared this other tradition heresy. And once they declared it heresy, heretics could be burned at the stake for simply believing differently from what the church said was correct. 200 years later, you have another pope in a, in a papal bull declaring that not only is there heresy, but that these, these women are evil witches and witchcraft and, and that Therefore, they must be put to death. And that's when you had the two German monks create the Malleus Maleficarum as a handbook for all of the little monks and priests that went out into these, who were part of the Inquisition. So this became part of the Inquisition. And they were going out investigating in all of these communities to find and root out witches with legal and spiritual backing. So that that's where it became the most extreme. That's probably the whole, the whole idea of the burning times and labeling women in such a negative way. And there, what they were actually doing that was helping, that was helping people um, as, as evil and that you can only go to the priests and, and these doctors who weren't able to really do much of anything except tell you, the priests, this is interesting, because in that time, all of the church, the church said is, no, accepting Jesus as a savior isn't good enough. You're going to hell. Wow. Your only hope is to do what we tell you to do so that you only spend so many thousands of years in a in a state of purgatory and then after and that other people will continue to pray for you and give us money to burn candles for you so that slowly you can be elevated into the christian heaven so the church the the, the church by this time had become such so draconian I mean, that's the only term that I can, I mean, there are other terms. That's <laughs> that one I find really, really uh, descriptive of how, how um, oppressive that it had become, not just of mother goddess and, and women, but of everyone and that your very existence is evil. And then we can go back to the whole story of Adam and Eve um, and, 
that this evil is based on on one of the two creation stories in Genesis, um, where Eve supposedly betrays Adam and herself by eating of the very fruit, the one thing they're told not to do, when, when in fact what she was doing was continuing to follow her own goddess tradition. Eve is a representative of, of the, the goddess that was already there. Ah, so, nice. yeah. It so, goes all the way back to that, that um, that this knowledge of this knowledge of good and evil, um, what she was doing when she, the serpent is talking to her, the serpent is the sacred totem of the of the goddess, and what she's following the advice, the the wisdom that the serpent is is giving her of what he's saying this is really all about. And so she follows that. And Adam, whose name actually comes from a Canaanite term, Adama, meaning that he was created by the goddess out of clay and her menstrual blood. And, and, and so what they're doing is hanging on to, to this tradition that the priests of the, the Hebrew priests at the time are trying to replace. And so you replace it by saying, because everybody's born of woman, everybody is evil because of what Eve supposedly did in our version of the story, rather than what was really going on. Wow. So, so that's right. So the church, and and I'm not, you know, I, I'm sort of woefully uneducated about everything in Bali. Is there Christianity in Bali? Yeah, there are communities over there. There are some communities as well. Yeah. And I think that's <clears throat> really striking how now women's this embodied, very fine science of, you know, being able to observe, you know, as you were saying, how much dosing to give, exactly what timing, exactly all these really, it's, you know, such fine science. And that was, you know, totally put down in a, and then things we're seeing that now today in the United States with the overruling of Roe v. Wade. Roe, and, Roe versus Wade, yeah. And so now I want to hear more about that. Like what? Okay. <laughs> I mean, every day there's something new. It's like, I'm trying and to keep sorry, up with it. And I will go into it more in my talk next Saturday. Roe versus Wade was was um, it, it was a Supreme Court case in 1973 um, that the court found in favor of the woman who brought the suit that that changed everything about abortion in in this country. <clears throat> now abortion was legal. And so we're now we're in 2022. So we're like almost 50 years down the road. And the, the current Supreme Court is because of a case brought by the state of Mississippi that wants to ban all abortions. Okay, I'm gonna to try to stay on track as much as I can. That is basically against, that's a violation of our US constitution. Of, of either amendment nine, nine or 10 that says that the state cannot pass laws that violate federal law. And Roe v. Wade is basically federal, federal law, but these states want to violate them anyway. <clears throat> Apparently our Supreme Court is getting ready to rule in favor of this state and allow and say that it is it is legal to ban abortion. <clears throat> and the Supreme Court justice who's writing uh, their justification for this, Supreme Court Justice Alito, he one of the things he bases <clears throat> this decision on, he says a precedent was was established in the 1600s by a jurist whose last name I believe was Harris. This jurist <clears throat> said in 
said two things. One, that rape is not possible in a marriage, that you know a woman should never refuse her husband, and if she does, he still has the right, blah, blah, blah. So she does not own her own body, he does. The second thing is this same jurist condemned women to the stake as witches. So Alito's argument is based on religious belief, which is a violation of the First Amendment of the separation of church and state. The Supreme Court is getting ready to violate the Constitution based on religious belief, saying that women, not only that, but he said, well, you know, this never should have passed. The, the amendment that was cited, he cites the 14th amendment at which, which um, allows for something called due process. But he neglects to talk about the separation of church and state in the first amendment. He also neglects to talk about the fourth amendment which protects a person's right to privacy in their papers and their property. By denying that, by ignoring that, he say, he's basically saying women do not own their own bodies. The state does. So that Mississippi and other states can say, no, you cannot have, you cannot have an abortion. We declare what you can do with your body. So that's, that's really, and it, to me, that, that's, that's the deeper argument, more yeah. than abortion being a health issue, which it is in some, you know, many cases. I, I don't know how many, but it is, it is the case at times. But much deeper, this whole thing is based on religion and who owns a woman's body. Not the woman, clearly, in, in what Alito is getting ready to what the Supreme Court is getting ready to declare. So, so that's a back, that's, uh, uh, yeah, and that's, that's a crazy back to an earlier century. Yeah. And it's a crazy thing because I think it, it's at so many subtle levels, uh, abortion, you're right. It's one thing, but I think in my experience, there's so many subtle levels where we, where we give away our authority you know, yes. thinking, really believing that uh, what somebody else says is true and correct. And so, you know, in, in at least my experience in getting empowered, it's, you know, you realize more and more that this is mine, th these are my opinions, this is my body. And so how would, well, so then what, from all of your experience what how can we how can we take more authority for our bodies for ourselves what can we do and how do you do well, it well community uh groups there's there's um there's be woman now project is a really good example in this country there's an organization women's march where uh we're marching um there needs to be there needs to be more lawsuits that are really based on the idea that you cannot make this decision based on religion or who owns a woman's body. That that violates at least two, if not three, of what we call the Bill of Rights in, in our US Constitution. And, and I think we are, we are going to see more law, I hope, I hope, uh, that we are going to see more lawsuits where that is the approach, where you cannot say, you cannot declare abortion illegal based on legal, uh, based on religious argument and, and violating these constitutional amendments. Um, so law is one way because the reality is that's not going to stop abortion. I mean, you know, abortion became legalized because abortion had been going on, not just in this country, but many countries. And, but in this country, what I know about is how often that they were unsafe and women died, they bled to death from them because of, of who they could find to perform the abortion. 
Mm -hmm. um, and and it's it's also what they are trying to do is is deny the natural operations of <laughs> on the of the female body that sometimes the female body will naturally abort. There are some states that want to pass laws that make that murder. Yeah, that's and, and I, so that's saying that a woman's body has no validity, has no validity whatsoever, because because and it goes back to the woman is is basically evil. And that's what it goes back to, because if the body can naturally abort and we can call it murder, we can say that a woman's body is basically evil. Well, you can't control that. How do you control that that the body, in some cases, naturally aborts? Yeah. And, and I mean, my personal opinion is, is that, I'm sorry, a collection of cells does not mean life. I, I do not subscribe to the Catholic tradition that life be begins at conception. Life begins when life is manifest into the world. That's a whole nother discussion, <laughs> but, but I disagree. I disagree with the, it begins at conception stuff. No, 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 no. What you've got is a collection of cells that are creating something definitely, but until it can exist on its own, in the world it to me it's not a lot it's not a being it's not a being yet yet it's becoming but it's not yet being so that, that and that's that's my stance so yeah <clears throat> yeah so that, you know this whole, yeah go ahead no, I think it's also so important for for us as, uh, for us to not we have to see our bodies as so much more. Yes, it makes children. Yes, you know, it bleeds, but it's capable of so many things. There's so much knowledge in here, and I think that we, yeah, really need to learn more about this and and really feel how special it is to have this vessel. Yes, and and I will say that since I mean I've grown up in this this um, in the '60s from the '60s mm -hmm. this women women's movement that that really began on um, college age women and and older women we we read a book oh gosh boy it really opened my eyes um, I can't remember what it I can't remember the title right now I read it when I was still in high school. But so women my age were really coming together in, in colleges. Uh, the college I attended, the university I attended, um, women moved, I mean, it was, you know, the 60s. There was the 60s. So, so we had wow. there, there were women uh, having sit-ins at this one building to get the university to pay attention to women's issues. And then of course, along with that, the, the war in Vietnam and protests and sit-ins. I mean, eventually that university was shut down and, and it was in, and I believe it was in 1973 and we were all sent home early so that things would not become violent. But, but that's when women really, really started doing more than just what the women had done in the early 20th century to get the vote. And what women at that time in both this country and England that I know of went through, went through to be recognized as not property, but as beings with a soul. Up to that point, women were seen not to even have a soul. And, and what women went through in this country and other countries to get the, the right to vote as citizens and to be, we're still struggling to be considered equal. Um, education, yeah, that's a big part of it. it and I, I am happy to see that, that young women now are so much more educated and see so much more that my body 
this is my body. It is my property. It does not belong to anyone else. And they cannot tell me, they cannot coerce, force me to, to do or not do with my body as I so choose as belonging to me. It does not belong to anybody else. And so I'm glad to see that more women are understanding that and acting on that that then what happens is that goes out into the community and it and it manifests in in law which is the same how how it was taken away from us was through law and retelling the stories and so we reclaim it through the same process and that is happening what's another interesting thing about Roe v Wade is that this is part of um <clears throat> It's a it's a backlash. It's a backlash on the part of men against women saying we have a right to do this because they seem to feel that not all men, but the patriarchy and and the men who buy into that um, seem to feel that the end game is to own and control everything and everybody. Um, and any way in which that is lessened or stopped, they feel that they are losing, that, that they are losing, you know, this whole cancel culture thing. Right. Really? <laughs> really? A bigger, yeah, a big hit to the two. Yeah, a big hit to the ego, a big hit to the pride to feel like I don't own that. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is, and oh. they're not losing anything, really. I think it's so wonderful to hear, uh, you know, you guys were really part of an amazing generation in the 60s, and oh, so many strong, really outspoken women, and of course, including you. And so you're all um, an inspiration for the younger generation, really have led the way. I'm glad. Mm hmm yeah, I'm glad. Absolutely, I'm glad because it's the only way that we can reclaim it totally. Uh huh. Yeah, in our working lives, our bodies are feeling a lot of autonomy in our relationships. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And so, are there any uh, final words of encouragement? Anything that we should know? <laughs> Hang in, so there. <laughs> Hang in there. Hang in there. Hang in there. You know, uh, keep learning, keep discovering. Uh, for the women who are involved in any of the things that Big Woman Project is doing, it it is it that is what it is doing. It is helping women discover these things and reclaim themselves for themselves. So. It's one of the reasons why I really like being associated with this this group because of the work that that it is doing and and so for the women who partake of it I keep doing it share it share it with your sisters get get see who more you can get involved in the Be Woman project and in other in other things um we, we all have to be activists of one kind or another, uh, whether it's signing petitions, being part of protests, you, you know, I mean, the, the range is endless of things that we can do to help in this reclamation project. So, That's so, beautiful. And tune in next Saturday when I talk about more of this, so. I really like what you said. We all have to be activists in some way or other in our lives. We do. Whether in our small circle or, you know, whether we have a bigger footprint. So I really like that. And, and for at whatever level one can be an activist, be, don't feel guilty about where you are and that you may not be where someone else is. Who cares where someone else is for yourself? It, w w at whatever level you can do it, be glad and happy with that. that, that you are making a difference at whatever level you are active.
Yay, celebrate everything. All of our small steps. Make the small steps into big steps. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and it's amazing because small steps and you don't really realize it at, until later. But those small steps, you're right, they lead to other things. And it's only when you get to those other things that you go, oh, oh, wow, I'm in such a different place than I was when I start. Wow. So you're right. Nice. And that's pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. I know all of the steps, all of your studies over the years, it's, I think, contributed to such a broad view that you have. So that's amazing. And, and that's been my, my intention all along. That's why I got started on this is because I knew women and men are hungry for this and don't know this and, and I need to get it out there, however I can get it out there. Nice. And that's what I've been trying to do all this time. Awesome. And I think final question, um, how do how do men also thrive in a society when the feminine is honored? Oh, well, men do thrive. Um, it, it's a realignment for them as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, I have a friend, his name is Terry, and he's such a good example of this. And and he talks about having gone through therapy and how it how it took a long time but how he's gotten healing you know a lot of it has to do with as women heal their wounds and trauma men men can see how they can you know how they have experienced wounds and trauma as as well and as they heal that and they can begin to see um women as full human beings as full people who who are not to be feared are not to you don't need to feel intimidated by them you don't need to be intimidating um relax <laughs> so uh, that's that's one benefit is they begin to see um healing healing is coming through healing changes their mindset also um a, a reconnection to nature really helps a lot um, because yeah because when because when we see this is another patriarchal thing patriarchy says humans are separate from nature mm. I, no we are a part of nature we are living beings and all beings are a part of nature and when we realize that, when we see that and understand it and begin to live it, that's how men benefit as well. They stop trying to um, develop it uh -huh. <laughs> and, you know, and create all of this pollution and, and all of the climate problems are a result of that as industrialization is a result of that. You know, there needs to, uh, and I don't suggest getting rid of industrialization. I suggest industrialization that is more as in harmony with nature as is humanly possible. So those two things, healing and reconnect, and not just those two things, healing, reconnecting with nature, but reconnecting with your own soul. And the, the patriarchal view takes this view of, of whatever is spiritual is out there somewhere and not in here. And, and it is in here. And when, when men as well as women begin to realize that it is within the soul and the spirit and, and that we are all a part of nature and how much we can learn by watching how animals operate, other animals, all other animals operate in, in nature and how so many of them interact with us that they, that they do not approach us, not all of them approach us in fear. There's so many stories of like a dolphin being tied up in a fisherman's net, sees these deep sea divers, goes to them for help 
and they're able to cut the net so that the dolphin can be freed. Whales, oh my goodness, whales and how they, um, if you've never been on a whale watch, you need to go on a whale watch because, because you're taken out into the ocean where the whales are. The whales are familiar with these boats. They, they surface, they, they start slapping the surface of the water, wanting the boat to come to them and they will come to the, I mean, come on people. <laughs> we have, we can learn so much just as we become reconnected to nature and become more aware of how nature operates and, and, um, all these different species, individuals of different species who form friendships with one another and will form friendships with us. And, you know, healing nature, reconnecting to your soul. Those, those to me, those are the big three. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. And there's, I'll just, uh, on nature note, one final note, there is in, in the Indian tradition, there's a, uh, a sage, Sage Dattatriya, and he has 24 gurus, 24 teachers, and it turns out pretty much all of them are from nature. So there he goes wandering. He learns from the mountain, from the rivers, from certain bird species, because yeah, all of those lessons are so pure. So yeah. Yeah, and, and healing, and healing and reconnecting with your soul so much of that can hap happen in nature, mm -hmm. in nature. So there you go, nature, our bodies, our sexuality, our spirituality. Yes, yes, so. everything, yeah. Well, thank you so much today for all of the knowledge that you shared and can really see when your passion comes out, it's really encouraging. <laughs> so we're looking yes, forward yeah. to again another- Thank you so much. Yeah, we're looking forward to another session yes. with you next week, Dr. Shari. And everybody, thank you right. if, um, who has joined. And if you have comments um, and questions, please put them in the chat. We love to hear from you. So thank you so much, Dr. Shari. Sharda thank and you. I, I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it tremendously. Wonderful. Good. I did also. I'm definitely going to look more into the, the, the stories that you told us. So thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. See everyone next Saturday. Okay. Oh.